Welcome back to the Green Rush Live. I hope you enjoyed that little 420 break. And I just want to welcome two great guests. It's going to be interesting because we're going to get into some testing. And I love testing. So I want to welcome Callum Pilkey from uh, Safetiva Labs and Chris Hudala from Pro Verde. And uh, they're two of the big labs out there that do all the testing. And I just want to have Callum introduce himself and tell us a little bit about himself and, and the lab that he represents. And then we'll have Chris and then we'll get into some questions. So go ahead, Callum. Let me hear about uh, Safetiva Labs. Well, uh, Safetiva is um, up and coming in uh, Western Massachusetts, um, based around a lot of uh, manufacturers. Right now, uh, we were founded on a uh, dedication to getting quite fast and reliable turnaround times. We aim for next day um, and we deliver. And uh, we're also trying to reach out to lots of home growers in our local community as well. Perfect. That sounds good. And Chris, let me hear about Pro Verde. Sure. My name is Chris Vidal and I'm the founder and chief scientific officer of Pro Verde Laboratories. Uh, we were one of the first laboratories in Massachusetts, uh, established back in 2013. Uh, so we've kind of grown with the program, uh, first under medical and then under adult use, but also work a lot with patients, caregivers, home growers, things like that. So uh, pretty involved in the industry. And um, Chris, I just want to ask you a question just to give the viewers a little idea of how it works when they send the product in or a dispensary or a grower sends a product into you guys can you just walk me through the steps so you receive their product and then what happens sure if this is a regulatory sample so it's controlled under the metric seed to sale tracking system uh, when it's delivered to us, there's a certain amount of weight verification, uh, making sure that the metric tags are appropriate and match the sample. Um, there's a lot of weight tracking that's associated with the transport in the metric within the metric system. Uh, once that's logged into our system, it's photographed. So we're photographing both the package, the contents. We're doing a microscopic uh, photograph as well. So we're looking for uh, particulate matter or contaminants that are visual under the microscope that shouldn't be there. Uh, once that's photographed, then it's separated into individual uh, aliquots. It's basically portioned out into different uh, portions of sample for the various tests that are uh, being requested. Uh, the state requires certain panels, laboratory test batches for different types of matrices. So we may need to make sure that all those tests, that there's enough sample for all those and that they're being completed. Uh, after they're weighed out for those individual tests, then they kind of go their own direction. There's different sample prep approaches or, or procedures for pesticides that is different from heavy metals. Uh, but at the end of the day, after all the testing is done, then the data comes together in a central database, uh, LIM system, laboratory information management system, which is then reviewed, and then the certificates are generated. Those certificates then are uh, sent back to the client at the same time that the uh, analytical test data is pushed to the state's metric database. That was a great explanation. I really appreciate it because uh, people don't realize how involved the testing process is. People think they just send it in, you pop it in a machine, and it just spits out these results, and then that's that's it. I, I actually understand the testing side of things so i understand the process of it and how involved it really is so um so callum one question for you what what's the most common heavy metals that you uh generally come across uh lead by far i would say um it, it's usually never enough to trigger the state's action limits but um it it, it we we see it more far more than any other uh heavy metal like cadmium or arsenic or something along those sorts. Is that similar for you, Chris? Is that what you see? A lot of lead? It depends on the grower. We typically see a little bit more on the cadmium side, um, but we can usually, when we're working with clients and have issues, we can usually track it down to their, uh, either their grow media or more commonly the nutrients that they're using. Hmm. Interesting. Josh, you have any questions about testing? Yeah, I'm I'm curious. I know there's a lot of different testing methods, so I'm just curious what you guys have settled on. Um 
I, I don't even know how many different types are there's liquid chromatography and gas um but I, what diff what, what do you guys use and how can you compare that in terms of accuracy and reliability this is only a half hour show <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think in general, most cannabinoid potencies are being done today by liquid chromatography. Uh, in the early days, gas chromatography was more common, but gas chromatography, you are converting the acid form to the neutral, and so you lose some information in the analysis. So the standard for most flower potency, at least, would be uh, HPLC, or liquid chromatography. Uh, heavy metals, uh, it's very common to use uh, ICPMS, it's inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. There are other techniques. There's several other techniques. Uh, for any one of these, there's there's multiple ways to uh, assess the, the analytes of interest. Uh, probably one of the biggest differences between laboratories would be the, uh, the procedure or the process for testing microbial contaminants, because there's a lot of competing theories and, and competing technologies. Uh, we have ours that we we stand behind. We've tried to validate the others and uh, found very unfavorable test results with the other uh, technologies that are available. And getting into that unfavorable unfavorable test results, um, how do you see things? Because as you were just saying, it's you can send certain products to three different labs and you can get three different results. And you guys are obviously in the industry. Is there any way to explain that to anybody how that could be possible is there just a different equipment that people use or i'll, yeah. let, I'll let callum start with that one <laughs> yeah it's it, it it's a uh, a bit of a twofold problem i'd say is um like the big problem being is batches of for example say flour are about 15 pounds and the um amount required for testing um is about 10 grams it is not even a percent like barely even like a 0.1 percent of an, the overall batch so it be, it becomes that you can pull several different samples from that batch and depending on the, the plant it's from the uh comp like the storage conditions you can um get just kind of a variety just because 10 grams is really not going to be rep super representative sample in a lot of cases. And it also depends where you actually take your sample off the flower. Yes. I mean, you take it from the top of the product and it's been in sunlight. Obviously it's going to have a lower THC because the sun makes it lower and uh, anything that was lower. Actually it's higher. So the that, more light it gets, the more production cannabinoid production. So the okay. top, bottom of the plant can differ by 50%. Um, so the light basically energizes the process for the biosynthesis of cannabinoids and terpenes. Well, that's great to know. Thank you for enlightening me. So pick the top good. bud. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you pick the top bud to get tested. Now do now do growers test the top and the bottom to see what it's going to be? I mean, I'm, you can kind of get a little bit of an idea what you have in the middle. In theory, uh, they're supposed to be, all of the buds are supposed to be homogenized. So you would submit a representative sample, uh, which means statistically you're hoping that you get some top bud, some middle bud, some uh, lower bud, because uh, you want to have a representative sample of the whole batch. As Callum was saying, 10 grams is not very indicative or representative of a 15 pound batch. So sometimes it's hard to get a representative sample. One of the biggest challenges we see when people are submitting to different labs is they'll pick three buds from the same plant and send them to three different labs, and then they get three different results. Well, they should. Those were three different buds. You don't know. One might have come off the top plant. One might have come off the bottom. Uh, so when people want to challenge the labs, which I highly recommend they do, they do it with some foresight, such that they are, are mixing, it, chop those buds into thirds and then mix them all together and then su submit a random sample. But you want to actually be sending the same sample to the three labs. That makes a very good point. And uh, we have a question from online from the uh, chat room. I just want to ask, um, 
Are you guys going to be participating in the ASTM Cannabis Conference as they're going to be setting testing precedents? So uh, we work with ASTM and AOAC and USP. So there's there's many scientific organizations that have been uh, working on standardization of testing methods. Uh, the USP, the United States Pharmacopeia, has been working with the FDA for, for decades um, and is taking a leading role. ASTM is also working with USP. So there's, there's a lot of collaboration that's starting to happen. Um, and we tend to work with all of them just because we... Uh, we need to make sure that the contributions or of the methods that we're providing are consistent across the industry for the various groups that are participating. How about you, Cal? Uh, I unfortunately am not high enough in the organization to talk about the any collaborating, but uh, I would rest assured to say that we um, any uh, developments we try to keep on top of and. Um, Test, testing being streamlined is, of course, a very important one as precedents are set, and we'll be paying attention to uh, kind of uh, see what standards are come up with. So how often do you guys see mold get set, like moldy product or flour gets sent to the labs? Often. Very often? Really? Very often, yes. Multiple wow. times a day. Wow. Is that the number one contaminant or what are you guys seeing in terms of uh, things that are coming coming through? What's a common contaminant that that you guys are seeing? I would say yeast and mold is the number one. Yeah. What's the cause of that and mitigations? The cause can be so, it, it can be many fold. Um, sometimes buds can grow so like large and tight that they can actually lock moisture in. And um, more or less, that's just, there's not going to be no circulation molds going to grow. It could also be storage conditions. Uh, I've seen, uh, I've worked in um, manufacturers with manufacturers before, and just sometimes facilities aren't the best. And that can cause um, storage issues and such as well um, to cause mold in mold growth. And really, Mitigation comes down to uh, uh, making sure you maintain a nice, clean, dry uh, storage space. And uh, it can also come down to the type of strains you grow because some of the terpenes that are grown have some antimicrobial effects. And I've seen strains per se that I will never see mold on, but I can also see strains that will just be riddled with it. Can you tell us what strains you do see that never have it and what? Which ones generally have it? The one that comes to mind most often is GMO is practically mm. indestructible um, from what I've seen. And <laughs> it's just, I, I, I don't know why. <laughs> no the name says on it. Uh, and like other strains, there's, there's just a lot that mold can grow on. And a lot of them, I've seen a lot of mold grown on a lot of different strains. GMO stands out as the creme de la creme when it comes to not having yeast and mold. That's really interesting. What about you, Chris? What What's the top uh, contaminants you're seeing, some of the causes, and do you have any mitigations for those? Yeah, so by far, Colm's right, the mold is probably the most uh, problematic. Uh, we will routinely go out to our customers' facilities and do environmental swabs. We'll swab the, the grow tables, the drains, the HVAC system, and we'll look for sources of contamination. Uh, and frequently we find it. Uh, one of the biggest uh, problems that we see in mold is a very specific species, Penicillium citronum, which is a systemic uh, mold, which gets in the tissue of the plant. And so oftentimes it's not visible. Uh, and so our clients are very surprised when they see mold failures because they didn't see any mold on the plant. That's a pretty challenging uh, mold. We believe that it may be in the grow medium that they're using, and it actually gets taken up in the roots of the plant. Um, so really, the, the mitigation would be uh, just doing some routine testing in-house for your own soil or grow medium. Uh, we provide our clients with SOPs and kits, micro kits, to do their own in-house testing to assess that. Um, that's been very helpful at helping them before they actually start to grow to see if they have a problem in their grow medium. Uh, 
again, Callum was right that hygiene, you know, disinfecting a, a grow room. Uh, there's a lot of commercial products on the market which are very efficient, uh, very non toxic. So we like to see them using non toxic uh, kill agents. Uh, and then right now, a lot of the producers have the ability to do remediation. So if they have uh, moldy product, uh, remediation is becoming a pretty standard practice in the industry. There's multiple techniques available from x-ray and, and microwave and ozone uh, that are all available. Those are not, I believe they're not prohibited or permitted under the Massachusetts regulations. So it's a little bit of a free-for-all there, um, but they are being used widely. Mm -hmm. What about the, the, the PG? Go ahead, Doc, Josh. I was wondering about the PGRs because you mentioned a, a dense nug or uh, somebody mentioned really tight buds um, and there's plant growth regulators that kind of create this dense bud. Um, and for me, it kind of, I, I don't know, like I, it's a similar to a cutting agent in a vape that causes me to cough. I get that same kind of cough. Um, is that prevalent where you guys are at? Are you seeing a lot of PGRs and um, people using alternatives just to to make it look and or feel more desirable? And what are some of the the drawbacks on that other than maybe coughing for me? <laughs> so Massachusetts doesn't test for a lot of these compounds. Massachusetts probably has the shortest list of compounds that are, are being tested for. Um, so we're not really looking for a lot of these. Interesting. Okay. Are any of the accredited labs in multi-states? Or is it like a lab just kind of is in one state? Because I you don't ever hear of any multi-state operations. At least I never have. I was just wondering if you guys are familiar. Um, say that, what's your question? Does any of the labs like... Pro Verde, do you have any labs in any other states? Um, we have a small facility in, in Maine, but there's several labs that have uh, in multiple jurisdictions. Okay. Perfect. And what's what's the oddest thing you guys ever found in a cannabis flower when you were testing it? Hmm. Oddest thing. Is it like just like a crazy metal, or did you just come across something and we're like, wow, that's weird? I never thought I'd find I'd see that day. Like, I just wondering if there's anything real crazy that just came across your plate and you just had something crazy to tell us. I I, I had a batch of sauce uh, I tested that came across at about seventeen and a half percent terpenes, which was like insane. Like I, I, I retested it. it um, I sent it out to a uh, another lab and it confirmed it. And I thought that was like, wow, <laughs> nearly almost the fifth terpenes. That's I've never seen that. Wow. It's probably yeah. toxic at that concentration. <laughs> yeah. It'd probably kill you. We've, we've had some samples in a, it was a, uh, again, it was a sauce, but it was like a hot sauce or something that um, under the microscope, there was actually live little squiggly things dancing around in there. That was uh, surprising. Yeah. And, and again, you don't see these things to the naked eye and you take them under a microscope and then all of a sudden you see like organisms growing in your and what you're about to ingest into your body. It's kind of crazy when you do it. And like you said before, people were very uh, surprised when they found a mold test and you're like, well, yeah, it's growing in your flower, but it's not visible. And, uh, and I wanted to ask you something, Chris, cause you said you swab the, uh, HVAC, uh, place. How many times do you find them contaminated? In general, a hundred percent. That's what I figured. I was waiting so, for that answer. <laughs> it's, it's really challenging to completely decontaminate a room. Uh, so even in the trim areas, um, we're working with a couple of producers for antimicrobial agents that are, again, very non-toxic that can be used to uh, mist or fog a room. Um, there are some fogging chemicals that are used, but they, they're highly toxic um, that you have special safety concerns, especially in light of, you know, the fatality here in Massachusetts. When you start using some of these very toxic reagents, uh, especially for fog in a room, you have to start thinking about employee safety concerns and how do you make sure that an employee doesn't go into a room that's being fogged. 
Um, and so really focusing on very effective non-toxic antimicrobial agents is, is uh, key. And so we're doing a lot of research with producers of these antimicrobial agents to demonstrate that they are effective at both kill and prevention uh, of microorganisms. That's very interesting. Yeah, I, I assume that the HVAC units were definitely a big provider of the mold spores because once it gets in them, I mean, you just have one contamination and it's you, you literally have to change your HVAC units and that's not feasible. So it's I was wondering how it's prevented or and if it happens, then what happens? But clearly you're saying they're pretty much 100% of the time contaminated. Even with the Oregon fires that happened a few years ago, a lot of farms were popping for mold and like, well, we didn't have any, we didn't see it, whatever. And then they, they figured it came through the filtration system and HVAC from the Eastern Oregon fires. And so a lot of the Portland area that had none of those issues were getting these airborne mold spores and that was popping everybody. So that kind of threw the, the Northwest or West coast into, into a loop and so I'm curious, like, what's going to be the fallout for Ohio and that train derailment and all of the issues with plants, pets, fish, everything dying? They're saying that people's DNA are changing. I've seen photos of cars. It's crazy. Um, so no Ohio cannabis for me anytime soon. What's going to happen indoors, outdoors with situations like that? Chris, go ahead. I know you're eager to jump at that one. Well, so we don't know. You know, we 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 play with nature, and a lot of the impacts uh, that we're causing, we're we're not actually going to know what the full impact is for years. So take take the creation of synthetic cannabinoids, all the Delta Eight products that are on the market. Uh, we've tested close to five thousand of these products that are based on isomerization reactions, and we have not yet seen one that does not have significant amounts of contaminants. By significant amounts of contaminants, I'm talking up to 30 or 40 percent of it are contaminated, uh, unknown molecular structures that are not found in nature. So if you think about the number of people who are smoking or, or vaping uh, these synthetic products, we have no idea how that's going to impact the next generations You know, after years of vaping these synthetics. There's been hypochlorous acid that's been used to get rid of mold, mildew, spider mites, and other contaminants naturally. Is there any other products, or would you agree with that, disagree with that, and do you know of anything else that might help with these in a more natural form? I've seen assassin uh, bugs used to help deal with uh, mites and such before. Um, it seems, at least uh, from what I've seen, a relatively safe way uh, to control mites, it's just you have to make sure to spread them out, and they'll just murder all the little bug the pests that they come across. How good are um? Oh, I was gonna say butterflies. Um, ladybugs. There you go. How good are ladybugs? I know a lot of growers put ladybugs in their grows for to for that to control the pests. Do you guys ever hear of that? Is that at all? Does that happen often? Not that I know of, at least. Um, I've, I've seen a couple of home grows where they where they use ladybugs. I don't know that uh, many commercial operations are using them. Um, there are a lot of uh, reagents on the market now, some using uh, nano silver or natural uh, surfactants like fatty acids. These are naturally plant produced, very non-toxic, um, that disrupt the propagation of some microorganisms. All right. Now I have one last question to wrap it up. So when you buy your soil in a bag, say from a certain company, you're saying some of that soil is contaminated, that some of the grow companies are actually selling contaminated soil, or is it when people are mixing different things? Because obviously the cannabis plant does suck up almost everything through the root system. So that's where we get a lot of the toxic metals. And you guys said lead was and other metals are pretty prevalent. So as the stuff that we're buying in on like in the stores, is that contaminated? We don't know. There's there's a good chance that it could be. It doesn't take much to get contaminated. I mean, where do where do these soils come from? They typically come from outside. 
Mm-hmm. You know what the failure rate is for microbial contamination in an outdoor grown cannabis plant? 100%. There's just too many microbes. There's too much mold. There's too much bacteria in the in the outside that if you have something that comes from outside, uh, you don't necessarily want to bring it into your facility uh, without some kind of sterilization. I know, I know people who autoclave their soil or, or their, their grow media just to make sure that there's no... Uh, no bad uh, microbes. But the other thing is that microbes are necessary for the growth. So that, that's also a detriment as well, because you're, you're killing beneficial bacteria and, and microbes. So it's a double-edged sword. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, and I really appreciate your time, both of you. Thank you very much for teaching us a lot about testing. I, I love the subject, to be honest, which obviously you both love it because you're in the industry. And uh Again, thank you so much, Josh. Do you have anything else to wrap it up or? No, I think that's good. Yeah. Wait for the the next segment and keep it rolling. Yeah. I think that was amazing guys. Thanks a lot again, Callum and Chris from, uh, Callum's from, uh, safety, the labs, Chris from pro Verde. Thank you so much for joining us on green rush live today. And I appreciate it. And we will catch everybody in a few minutes. Go ahead, have another smoke break and we'll be right back. With that, we're going to roll this one up. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, or don't, and I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out and check out these other videos that we've got.